Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking History. My name's Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're all keeping well. On this channel, I do exactly as it's called, I talk all about history. And now we are near the very, very end of the Anglo-Saxon period. Maybe just a couple more videos to go here and there. But we have reached it. And if you are stuck with me right from the start, going through from Alfred the Great, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. And hello to any new subscribers. Thank you so much. And I've been loving reading all your comments below. So thank you. Really, really, really means a lot. Thank you. So this is part two. And I said last week I weren't sure whether it was going to be two or three parters. It's going to be a three parter. If, I, if I'm going to do Howard Godwinson and the Godwin family and Battle of Hastings and all the bits in between, I want to make sure I do it right. So there's going to be three parts to this. So it, last week was all about the start of how Godwin's and the Godwinsons become so powerful and everything and then their exile. But if you haven't watched that, I'll link it down below so you can go and watch that first before you watch this video. Because otherwise, if you watch this one, you'll be like, what? What's going on? You'll be like halfway through a video, halfway through a film and have no idea what's going on. So go and watch that first and then come back and watch this one. So let's get ready for part two. Enjoy. <laughs> The Godwins were gone and King Edward, wow, he was just walking around his castle as if like, I got rid of the Godwins, I'm the king of the castle. Don't ask, don't ask. <laughs> but Edward's own scribes, they were blaming Robert of Chumiege and Edward soon handed out the Godwins lands to his own men. The southwest part of Swain's lands, they were given to Oda of Deerhurst, who was the king's kinsman. Howard's East Anglia lands, they were given to the um, Earl of Mercia's son. And Robert of Chumiege, well, he received lands in Wessex. And the remaining Godwin's lands, they were kept with the king. The house of Godwin was gone. The youngest Godwinson, Wolfnoth, and uh, Godwin's grandson, Hacken, they were still held as hostages. But the Godwins still had power and they had powerful friends throughout Europe. Throughout the Chronicles, it was mentioned that the Godwins were a close family. And once they fled, Godwin, his wife Gaitha and Tostig, they went to Flanders. Harold and Leofrine, they went to Dublin to hire Viking warriors. And what about Swain? We're missing out on Swain. Swain was heading to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. I'm very doubtful that this was actually Swain's idea. It's more, well, actually, no, it's very likely that it was Godwin's idea. And Godwin needed English sympathisers. And he needed the Holy Roman Emperor. So off Swain, off he went. But he did it in his true Swain style. He walked barefoot. So Godwin, who was in Flanders, he went to Bruges. And there he wrote to the king, begging for them to return. But there is also a good reason why um, Godwin was in Flanders. Not only was it the home of his son-in-law, of his son's father-in-law, but Flanders was also a pirate's nest. And Godwin, well, he decided 
he was going to be a bit like his father, Wolfnoth, by turning to piracy. On March the 14th, 1052, Emma of Normandy um, died. And this must have had an impact on Edward, even though they didn't have the closest of relationships, but this must have had such an impact on him. As she was still his mother and it must have had quite the impact. And surprisingly, Edward had Emma buried alongside her second husband, King Canute, and not his father, King Ethelred. Edward also had a new coin issued and coins at this era wasn't just for currency, but issuing new coins was also the only interaction that most of the population actually had with their king. Looking, on, looking at their coin, going, oh, that's what he looks like. No one knew. Um, and so for this coin, Edward made a point of facing right, where he had a long white beard and he held the scepter and he was wearing a war helmet. And it was Edward's way of letting everyone know that he was a warrior king. The only problem was he wasn't really fooling anyone, maybe himself, but not anyone else. So Edward was soon warned that Godwin was planning something. Edward had both Somerset and Devon protecting the southwest coast. So he placed 40 ships at Sandwich under the control of Ralph and Oda. And there they were, they sat and they waited. Then on the 22nd of June in 1052, Godwin and his pirate fleet entered the English Channel. And they were heading straight for the Royal Fleet at Sandwich. And it wasn't long before they were spotted. But nothing happened. Godwin just sailed straight past him and go, oh, there's Godwin. Oh, there he goes. And he's gone. And he just sailed straight past them and but and he landed at the tip of Kent in um, Dungeness, completely unopposed. And when Godwin landed, he was given a hugely warm welcome. He was still so popular in the south and the royal fleet, they eventually got their, uh, their bum into gear and they gave chase, but not straight away. So it gave Godwin enough time to board his ships and sail west to Pevensey Bay in Sussex. But Godwin's fleet was hit by rough, 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 rough winds and they were hurled into the channel. So Godwin went back to Bruges. Now the Royal Fleet, they were also hit and they managed to get back and then the fleet was, was decommissioned. So Godwin knew he had to change tactics. So he sailed from Bruges again, and this time he headed to the southern coast. Harold and Leofrine, they sailed from Dublin with nine ships, heading for the Bristol Channel. And once they were there, they ra raided the boundary between Somerset and Devon, stealing food, capturing people. They butchered the regional army that was raised against them, killing more than 30 Thanes. Harold and Leo Fine then continued east, ravaging everything on the way. Godwin, he landed at the Isle of Wight and he set the whole thing on fire. Whatever they, they stole whatever they wanted, they killed whoever got in their way. And then Godwin suddenly stopped, just stopped. Everyone stopped. At that exact same time, 
a third battlefront opened. On the border of Wales, Gruffydd launched an attack against Herefordshire, the land of Ralph. Gruffydd launched a battle, killing high-born Englishmen and Frenchmen, and it appeared that Swain's friendship with the Welsh king had paid off. Gruffydd gave the Godwins a hand. So King Edward fled to London, and he locked himself behind the city gates, much like his father had done before him. And once Edward was hidden, he ordered for the Royal Navy to assemble on the Thames just up from the London Bridge and to hold the waterway. There was an assemble fleet of 50 ships. Now this was a smart move for Edward. The not so smart move was putting Ralph in it. You know, the ones who just let Godwin sail by. Ralph and Oda were in command of this one. Edward also sent messages throughout England asking anyone who remained loyal to the crown to raise their forces and to come to London in his defence. In Dorset in late August, Godwin and his sons finally met again and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles stated that the sea was full of ships and they headed to London and Godwin, he began encouraging local men, in particular sailors, to save the king from wicked figures in court. Godwin had Romney, Folkestone, Hythe, Dover and Sandwich all provide men and ships. Now, other towns they were also lending men and ships and supplies and by the time Godwin had reached the Thames he was leading an armada. He was also accompanied by land-based forces who were marching through the south and more supporters made their way towards London. Godwin had a massive land and sea invasion. Now a portion of Godwin's fleet broke off. It's believed to be Harold and his um, Viking ships and they headed to the Medway and they ravaged their way up the river until they reached their target of King Edward's properties at Milton Regis which they burnt to the ground. King Edward was facing an uprising and on September the 14th, 1052, Godwin reached his estates in Suffolk. Now Godwin knew that London Bridge would be a problem and the fleet behind London Bridge. So Godwin met with the Londoners and he, he was seeking a compromise. And although there's nothing recorded about what was actually said, the Londoners promised Godwin a safe passage on the tide. And so Godwin and his fleets, they sailed past the blockade. And again, Earls Ralph and Oda were, who were in command of the fleet and they just watched him sail past. So, oh, there's Godwin. Oh, oh. And he's gone. And Godwin went to the king to seek peace. Godwin sent messengers to King Edward pleading for him for reconciliation. And But Godwin didn't just want to be friends. He also wanted his sons. He wanted his, he wanted his sons and his lands back. And even though... Godwin had Edward surrounded, Edward refused. And so Godwin asked again, he even offered more hostages. And again, the king refused. Now those who were with the king, 
who were Earls Leofric and Seward, they were reluctant to fight a civil war. And they could really see that Godwin really was trying to resolve this peacefully, uh, as peacefully as, you know, if possible. And Edward's support in court collapsed all around him. Now, Robert of Chumierge and the other Norman nobility, they fled London, leaving Edward all alone. Now, when Robert of Chumierge fled, he also took Wolfneth and Hacken with him back to Normandy and he handed them over to um, Duke William of Normandy. Now the Normans were gone, Edward was truly alone. So outside the city walls, he decided he would hold a great council and there will take place at, at his palace in Westminster. From there, the matter will be resolved. Godwin and Howard arrived at the entrance of, where, of Westminster Palace in full body armour, along with a large army. King Edward welcomed them at the entrance of his palace. Now, this wasn't because he wanted to. This was what was the tradition demanded. Godwin threw his weapons to the floor and he threw himself at Edward's feet, begging for mercy. He told Edward that he was innocent of everything that he had been accused of and he was prepared to prove it. He really wanted nothing more than for things to go back to as they were and King Edward welcomed them back into the palace. On the advice of the Witan, the king forgave Godwin and his family and all of them were restored back to full status. This included all of their lands, their titles, the processions, everything. Edward also pardoned Godwin's fleet and the army and as part of the agreement, Edward um, called for Edith back from the nunnery. Robert of Chumierge and the other Norman nobility were declared outlaws even though there was already in Normandy. And Bishop Strigand he was made Archbishop of Canterbury, although he was never officially recognised as the Archbishop of Canterbury because he never actually went to Rome to get his um, thing to say that he was Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was also excommunicated by four different popes. The God now. The Godwins, they are back. But what about Swain? As the meeting with Godwin and Edward was taking place, Swain was returning home. Swain had reached Constantinople. God, I'm so glad I pronounced that right. Then on September the 29th, 1052, Swain Godwinson died. And that's all what was what was recorded. There's nothing else. William of Malmesbury later said that he was murdered, but then there was another account that came up not long after that, saying that he died through the cold weather and walking barefoot. And so the Godwins were back, but there was minus Swain Godwinson, Wolfnoth and Hacken still held hostages this time in Normandy. So it's now Easter and the Godwins are celebrating with um, with the king and they'd been feasting for days and they were all mending their rift. 
Easter Monday celebrations were continuing and then Earl Godwin collapsed, possibly from a stroke. His sons rallied around him and Godwin remained in a comatose state for days. Then finally, on April the 15th, 1053, Earl of Godwin, Earl of Godwin, Earl Godwin of Wessex died. He was aged around 60. Godwin's body was taken to the Old Minster and Earl Godwin was later laid to rest near his old king and ally, King Canute. The people of Wessex honoured their fallen Earl. Godwin didn't just hold his family together, but he held his kingdom together. Howard Godwinson, he was, well, he was now the eldest son, unfortunately, since Wayne died. He now led the family. And Howard, he was stable and he was unflinching in his style of leadership, much like his father. Howard Godwinson was now Earl of Wessex and the kingdom rejoiced. He gave his East Anglia earldom back to the king and Tostig, he really wanted to be Earl of East Anglia. But King Edward gave East Anglia to Alfgar, Earl Leofric's of Mercia son. It's possible that King Edward gave East Anglia to Alfgar because he um, governed it during um, Godwin's exile. And if the records are correct, Alfgar's mother was none other than Godgifu, also known as Lady Godiva. That's only if the records are correct. So in 1055, Earl Seward, Earl of Northumbria, died. His eldest son had died before him and his other son, he was way too young to rule over the rebellious kingdom. Now, Alfgar, he really wanted to rule Northumbria instead of East Anglia. But maybe through the influence of Queen Edith, who was close to Tostig, Northumbria was given to Tostig. And Alfgar, who is in his 40s, was actually a lot like Swain Godwinson. He was someone you really didn't want to pee off and he was rash, he was impulsive and now possibly, and it's actually quite probably actually, through the influence of Queen Edith, Edward gave Norfolk to Gerth Godwinson that was basically half of East Anglia. So there's Edward giving East Anglia to Alfgar and they go, oh, actually, I'm going to take half of it away. Sorry, I'm just going to take half of it and then I'm going to give that to Gerth. There we go. So you can share it now. That's a bit of an insult, isn't it, really? <laughs> so Al Alfgar, he and Tostig had a feud with one another. I think everyone's feuding here. Everyone's got a feud with one another. And the 1053 Chronicles stated that Alfgar, I don't know where this come from, it just suddenly come out of nowhere, Alfgar was a traitor to the king and all of England. Alfgar had his lands stripped and he was declared an outlaw, but we don't know what he'd done. That's not recorded. 
There's nothing to say what he actually did. Did he do a swain? Did he kidnap a nun? I don't know. There's just nothing there. And it's so frustrating. So Alfgar went into exile. And then the whole of East Anglia was given to Gerth Godwinson. Alfgar, he went to Ireland. Now, let's find out a little bit about Tostig. We haven't talked enough about Tostig. And so let's get to know him a little bit. Now, if we were to compare him to his older brother, Harold, they were both handsome, they were responsible and they were brave. And they were also serious and competent. But other than that, they were really quite different. Now, Harold, he was welcoming, he had a friendly demeanour, he was easygoing and he was fun and he communicated with his companions. And he didn't really mind being contradicted. So if he come up with something, you go, ah, oh, no, that's not a good idea. Go, oh, okay, tell me why. Yeah, give me, give me why. And he was quite happy with that. He was also tall and he swore a lot. And he also had a lot of friends. Now, Tostig. Tostig was secretive. He despised dissension. He was intensely focused. And Tostig was also deeply religious and he was inflexible on convictions and he was ruthless in his pursuit, in his pursuit of evildoers. He was a loner. He preferred to keep his own counsel and he could hold a grudge for life. Tostig. He never swore and he was also short and he had been feuding with Alfgar's family for forever. Now another Godwinson, Leofrein, he was made the Earl of Essex, Middlesex, Hereford and Surrey. Now, Gerth Godwinson, not only did he have um, East Anglia, he also had Cambridgeshire and Oxfordshire given to him. Now, thanks to Queen Edith, her brothers had become incredibly powerful and virtually the whole of England was under Godwinson's control. Now, back to Alfgar. He was in Ireland and he decided he was going to be a bit like the Godwins and he hired pirates, well, Vikings, yeah. And he had 18 ships with 1,000 men under his command. But, excuse me, but what Alfgar wanted, it wasn't enough for what he wanted to do. So he needed more support and he seeked that support from Gruffid. Now Gruffid, he was powerful. He controlled almost all of Wales. Plus he had a lot of experience in fighting and working with the English. Now, although he and Alfgar were um, rivals, but Alfgar was desperate, so he had to work alongside his enemy. Now, Gruffid, he wanted to be the sole ruler of Wales. And there was only one problem with him becoming the to, to um, govern the entire lot of Wales was Gruffid, another one. This was Gruffid the High Bath of Southern Wales. Now, our Gruffid, he agreed to help Alfgar and to secure their alliance, 
Grafid married Alfgar's sister, Algaith. I think I pronounced that right. Now, Grafid, Agrafid, then brought together his own army of around 2,500 men. Along with Alfgar's 1,000 men, 3,500 men. This was a real threat. So Alfgar and his fleet headed to Hereford. Now for Gruffid to join them and to unite their forces, he had to go through the lands of his enemy, Gruffid the High Bath. So he had to go through Gwent and Harkenfield. Is it Harkenfield? Harkenfield? Harkenfield. Now, there's nothing to say what actually happened. All what was recorded was Gruffid ap Llewellyn slew Gruffid the High Bath. That was it. That's it. Nothing else. And in that precise moment, Gruffid ap Llewellyn became the first true king of Wales. It took him 16 years to achieve this. Now, Gruffid, he decided he was going to celebrate. He celebrated by invaded England. So he marched into southwestern Hereford and he met up with Alfgar. So on the 24th of October in 1056, Gruffid fought the Saxons with Ralph as their leader. Gruffid pursued them into Hereford and he massacred them and burnt the city. The minster was burnt, the clergy was killed, Hereford was stripped of its relics. Ralph, King Edward's nephew, he fled the battlefield and his army, seeing him run away, they followed. They went, oh, where well, he's going, look at that, I'm going too. And then after that, Ralph was earned the nickname of Timid Ralph. Well, Ralph the Timid. Now, Howard Godwinson, Earl of Wessex, he gathered a large army and he headed to Hereford to push the Welsh army and Gruffid out. However, when he got there, no one was there. So there he continued and he went towards the um, Welsh lands and he stationed at uh, Monmouthshire. Now, Howard, he went back to Hereford, which was now terribly exposed. And Howard oversaw the town's fortification defences in the walls and the gates and the walls was part of the walls, they still stand today. Now, terms were, neg were negotiated and they were reached between um, Howard and Graffit, a meeting at Arkenfield, which is modern day. Arkenfield itself no longer exists. And so it is more modern day West Herefordshire now. So England paid heavenly, heavenly, heavily for the truce and to retain peace between the two. Gruffid returned home as the first king of all Wales and his land now extended to those that were once held by the English. And now Wales, for the first time in a very, very long time, there was that peace. Now, Alfgar, he was given everything back. He had everything. <laughs> so Tostig, the newly appointed Earl of Northumbria, he was trying to reach new subjects and he appointed a local administrator named Copsiger, 
I think I'm pronouncing that right, as his deputy. And um, Tostig, he was making smart decisions. And he even put efforts in maintaining um, peace with Scotland. But Tostig, he was ruthless in enforcing justice and ousting evildoers. And he implemented West Saxon laws, but we're not told what those laws were. And Tostig was quickly getting complaints. But Tostig's temperament made it hard for him to make friends. And he was a severe man who believed justice and he believed in justice and he believed that law applied to everyone no matter who you were it applied so going forward to 1057 the lack of an heir was really becoming an issue for edward who was in his 50s and he was still childless. So Edward's nephew, Edward the Exile, he was found and he returned to England. I did a, um, I included Edward the Exile in my video about Edmund Ironside. I'll link it down below so you can watch that one and find out a little bit more about Edward the Exile. So Edward, were, Edward the Exile was married to Agatha and they had three children, two daughters, Margaret and Christine, and a son, Edgar, who would become known as Edgar the Eighthling. Now, when Edward the Exile landed in England with his whole family on the 19th of April, 1057, he never got the chance to meet his uncle. He died suddenly. And Edward the Exile's children, they remained at court. And it appears King Edward and Edith adopted Edgar and gave him the name Edgar the Aetheling. And Agatha, their mother Agatha, she disappears from all records. After there's just that one bit where Edward the Exile arrived in England with his wife Agatha and then after that, gone. There's no further records of her. Also in 1057, on the 30th of September, Earl Leofric of Mercia died. Mercia was now given to Alfgar. East Anglia, all of East Anglia was given back to Gerth Godwinson. And on the 21st of December, 1057, Ralph the Timid died. The Earldom of Herefordshire was now given to Howard Godwinson. In 1059, Malcolm III from Scotland visited the English court and Malcolm, who was 28, he had come to England to arrange a marriage and Malcolm's choice was the 14-year-old Margaret, Edward the Exile's eldest daughter. So you might be questioning, well, why? Why would he choose someone like Margaret to be his wife? What's he going to benefit from that? If her younger brother was possibly being raised to be the next successor, Edgar could possibly be the next King of England. That, and then marrying the King's sister? That's going to be good for Malcolm III. Now, they would marry, but they wouldn't marry until 1070. Now that, if you are interested, is for a whole other video. So Earl Alfgar, back to him, less than a year after being given Mercia, he'd been kicked out of England again even sent into exile again. And there's nothing, nothing again. Well, the, well, I say nothing. The English Chronicles really, really, really try to hide it. But then in the Worcester Chronicles, it was recorded that 
after being act hard again for what we don't know for again Alfgar teamed up with King Graffid again and a large Norwegian fleet he'd reclaimed his position again and that's all we're told that's that and it, you know if for someone who's like a budding novelist if you was a novel I mean I, I I wouldn't even know where to start so not don't look at me but <laughs> but for there'd be so many blanks for you to fill in you could really play with that I think that would be good but anyway so as time was going on and there's still no successor it was becoming a serious problem and the only one with a legitimate claim to the throne was too young but there was Margaret But to have a female rule all of England during the Anglo-Saxon periods, that was an absolute no-no. That couldn't happen. Couldn't have a woman as queen. No, no, not not fully rule in England. But there was someone. Granted, he had the weakest claim to the throne, but he was the most powerful. And he made the most logical choice, Harold Godwinson. Harold was an opportunist. And when an advantage came to him, he didn't think twice about grabbing it. So in 1062, Earl Alfgar died. And his earldom went to his eldest son, Edwin, who was, he was still relatively young, but he was old enough, just. And you know, when I said that um, Howard was an opportunist? Well, with Alfgar now dead, he wanted to shatter the Mercian and Welsh alliance. Now, Southern Wales, they had also seeked Harold's assistance. So on Boxing Day in 1062, things have been quiet in Wales since 1058. And Gruffydd's men, most of Gruffydd's men, they were kind of on a Christmas holiday. They was on a break because that's the only time they had their downtime the rest of the year they was with the king so Gruffid was in his Christmas residence of Rhythan I want to say Rhythan Rhythan I think it's Rhythan and he had his guard down so from Gloucester Howard Godwinson and a very large army they headed straight to Rhythm. no one knew he was coming so it wasn't until he was practically on the doorstep when he went oh crap so Gruff had got notified and his he and his remaining men they rushed to the harbour and they boarded a ship and they fled out to sea and it's probably they're headed to, um, to Ireland as Ireland and Wales, they gave each other self, um, safe harbour. So when Howard discovered that Gruffydd had escaped, he ordered for his palace at Rhythan and all of the remaining Welsh fleet in the harbour to be burnt. And Howard returned to Gloucester that very same day. So... Harold now realised that he had just started a war with King Gruffydd, he turned to his brother Tostig for help and together they made a plan. Gruffydd, he returned to Wales and he also began planning for war. Gruffydd, who no longer had his um, alliance with Mercia since Alfgar died and his heir, Edwin, was pretty much told not to get involved. So Gruffydd's Welsh people 
were beginning to get irritated with their king as one of the main ways that Gruffydd had asserted his power to become the first king of Wales was by seizing powerful city and towns, places that had links to the sea, such as Carnarvon and Rhythm, and the people in those cities, they'd had enough. In late May 1063, Howard launched a large scale fleet from Bristol and they crossed the channel and beginning at nearby Glamorgan, they ravaged Wales. Howard and his men burnt everything they could find, killing everyone they found, burning buildings and seizing all of their possessions. They even attacked holy sites. All of this was because Southern Wales had remained resistant to Gruffydd's, um, well, tactics, really. They, they didn't want Gruffydd as their king. And it was, in Southern Wales was the last territory that Gruffydd had conquered with the, Alp, with the help of Earl Alfgar of Mercia. Now, Gruffydd's Southern companions they weren't loyal to, to him. Now, coming from Northumbria, Tostig ravaged through North Wales. So in the ragged lands of Snowdonia, the lands that Gruffydd knew like the back of his hand, it was here that the fate of Wales would be decided. As either way, Gruffydd or Howard had to lose. King Gruffydd was an excellent military commander. So I think my cat's playing with something. Um, so he was an excellent military commander and the Godwinsons brothers, they came at Wales at each side. Howard has struck through the coastal towns and Tostig took the fight directly to Gruffydd's homeland in the north. And Howard's hold on the coast was blocking Wales, making it impossible for Ireland to support Gruffydd. So no matter which way Gruffydd chose, whichever part of Wales Gruffydd chose, one part of Wales would be abandoned and it was left to the mercy of the Godwinsons brothers. So soon enough, the brothers were in Gruffydd's mainland in Snowdonia. Now Gruffydd's army, they were lightly armoured and they struck the English force quickly, even before the English could respond. And the Welsh quickly ran into the hills, outpacing the pursuing English, who were weighed down by their much heavier armour and weapons. So Howard, who was quick to adapt, he told his army to fight in leather armour and that would be much lighter and they can focus all of their energy on quick movements. Howard had completely brutalised all Welsh men and boys. Gruffydd quickly began to lose allies, which now included his own half brothers they switched sides Gruffydd knew that his end was coming on the 5th of August 1063 the head of King Gruffydd was delivered to Howard Godwinson and Howard sent Gruffydd's head onto King Edward it was recorded that Gruffydd was taken a bath his defences were down and he was decapitated by his own men. Howard returned to England victorious. Howard's devastation of Wales meant that the region never unified as a single independent nation again. The territory to the east was once again reclaimed by England and by the time the 
this was recorded by the time the Doomsday Book was completed in 1086. Tostig returned to Northumbria and almost immediately he raised taxes, possibly in order to pay for the war with Wales. And Tostig, who really wanted East Anglia, never liked Northumbria and Northumbria didn't like Tostig. And Northumbria really wanted someone else as their Earl. In 1064, the Norman Chronicles had stated that Howard Godwinson had visited Duke William of Normandy and he made an oath to William that he was Edward's heir to the English throne. Uh, there's also another document that records Howard's visit to Normandy, though it's not really a document, more of a a tapestry, the Bayo tapestry, that there's four to five different accounts of Howell travelling to Normandy, if he even had at all. So there's William going, oh, Howell's just um, said I'm, I'm the heir, I'm the heir to England, and there's go, well, where's the proof? Oh, um, yeah, I think I've lost that. I've got it somewhere, I'll, I'll dig it out from somewhere. So the different accounts ranged from Howard went over to get his brother and nephew out of captivity, then becoming a prisoner himself. Uh, another account was King Edward sent Howard over to get his other nephew, Walter, and his wife, who are also being held captive by William of Normandy, in Edward's last ditch attempt to secure a successor. But my absolute favourite has to be from William of Malmesbury. Howard was in Normandy for a spot of fishing and he got blown off course. Then, oops, got captured by William of Normandy. Then they wonder why we are all so confused. <laughs> There's so much confusion. Uh, now it's 1065 and Edward the Confessor was becoming ill. And to make matters worse, Harold Hardrada had made a claim on the English throne through his uncle, King Magnus of Norway and the agreement he made with Hartha Canute all those years ago. So back over in Northumbria, they were all getting really, really peeved at Tostig. His high taxes, no sanctuary. He had been hiring Danes to act as his officers. Tostig was having nobles executed. Northumbria had enough. It's recorded that 200 armed rebels had um, risen in York and York is a fortified town. It could easily hold back 200 rebels. So it's more likely that it was a lot more than 200. So They didn't burn anything, they didn't ravage, nothing. They headed straight for Tostig's treasury, wanting the taxes back. The guards, they fled the city and once they got over the walls, they were killed. On the second day, on the north side of the Humber, another large number of people were um, killed. The Earl's tenants, which was possibly meaning the Danes, and the rebels were getting more and more widespread support. Many more people joined and they sent messages out for Tostig to get out. And for Morcar, the um, younger brother of um, Earl of Mercia, Edwin, 
to govern them. Tostig had a long running feud with Alfgar and his family. Now, Edwin, Earl of uh, Mercia, who was Morcar's older brother, he immediately set up um, groups, including um, troops, not groups, troops, including Welsh troops. So during the rebels leading the army, they went to Northamptonshire, Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, then on to Northamptonshire, where they were joined by Earl Godwin, um, Earl Edwin's brother, Morcar. Now, King Howard, he sent King Edward sent Howard Godwinson and his men to negotiate terms. So they negotiate these terms with the rebels and Howard returned back to the king with their demands. But the rebels then escalated and they began killing anyone in the area and who had anything to do with Tostig. The killing was fierce, but the amount they killed, they captured double that amount and they kept them as hostage, sending them to sending them north. The, the fields, the homes, anything they could get their hands on were burned. People who did nothing wrong were losing everything. The slaughter had escalated through all the earldom, reaching as far south as Oxford. Then on the 28th of October, the King's messengers met with the rebels. King Edward pleaded with them to um, stop and instead put their concerns with the, the law, to the law. Edward promised them that he would right every wrong and have every injury they could prove addressed. The rebels replied, the first thing the king must do is exile Tostig from England. Edward held the council at Britford near Salisbury on how to handle the rebellion. The council were angry at the Godwinsons, especially Howard. They, they accused Howard of initiating it. Not quite sure how, um, but Howard denied this under oath. And then they accused Tostig over his, um, his greed and his just unjust behavior. King Edward, he refused the rebels demands choosing to stand beside his brother-in-law so they would get a war instead. The king summoned an army but hardly anyone responded to the call. Edward waited for nearly two months and hardly anyone answered that call. Edward had lost the war before it even began and he had no choice but to grant the rebels their wishes. Tostig, his wife Judith and a number of their thanes were exiled. Tostig and Howard's relationship now imploded. Tostig blamed his brother for his exile. Tostig had answered every call his brother made. But when Tostig needed him, Howard did nothing. But then, realistically, what could Howard do? Tostig needed supporters, so he went to his father-in-law, Count Baldwin V of Flanders. And Tostig looked towards a new ally, Howard Hardrada. On December the 28th, 1065, King Edward fell seriously ill, possibly from a stroke. The Fita Edwardi had said that Edward was drowsing in and out of consciousness. 
And then Edward suddenly said in a clear, strong voice, May God repay my wife for her beautiful and loving service. She has certainly been a devoted servant to me and has always been at my side like a beloved daughter. May God's mercy reward her with eternal joy in heaven. King Edward then offered his hand to Howard and he said, I, com I commend this woman and all the kingdom to your protection. Remember she is your lady sister and serve her faithfully and honour her as such as such for all the days of her life. Do not take away from her any honour that I have granted her. Now that is cr pretty spectacular coming from someone who has been in a coma for a week and before that he was extremely restless and before that he was having visions of dead monks. Blimey. It was also said that Edward gave um, Harold command of all of his servants and his vessels and asked that for anyone who didn't wish to serve under him be granted safe passage and along with all they acquired whilst serving under him. Finally, he gave Howard specific instructions of where he wanted to be buried in Westminster Abbey. Edward was given his last rites and between the 4th and 5th of January in 1066, King Edward, also known as Edward the Confessor, died. Edward would be buried in Westminster Abbey on the following day the 6th of January in 1066. The king had died without a clear heir. It's quite possible that Edward had named Howard as his heir, but it's also told that he had also named William of Norm Normandy and also Swain of Denmark. The truth was the only one, there was only one who had a direct bloodline and that was Edgar the Eighthling, although he was only 14 and we all know how that turned out last time with a 14 year old as king. But then there was the Witan and they, the one, they were the ones who had elected kings and they put forward Howard Godwinson. Howard Godwinson was elected to be Edward's successor and on the 6th of January in the afternoon after Edward's funeral at Westminster Abbey, Howard Godwinson was crowned King of England, becoming King Howard II. Howard quite possibly thought that this was his triumph, but really it was Edith's. She put it all into motion. She made sure that all of her brothers were pretty much ruling the entire of England. It was Edith's triumph, not Howard's. So there we are. That is the end of part two. Make sure you like and subscribe and that little, little teeny tiny bell so you don't miss out on video number three which I will try and make sure that's the last one and then we'll carry on down the line so I hope you enjoyed this video let me know what you think in the comments down below and please 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 do like and share and subscribe to this teeny tiny channel so we can reach more history lovers like yourselves look after yourselves and I'll see you all next time bye